Hi everyone, welcome to our Life on the Road in Europe webinar. My name is Liz Reese and I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at ACIS. I'm going to be your moderator for this webinar tonight. I need to take one minute to explain a little bit how the logistics of a webinar will work. You should all see a panel on the right side of your screen. You're all in listen-only mode, so your questions can be typed into a box right in your panel. Um, we will have time for questions at the end of the webinar. Um, but during, throughout the webinar, you are free to ask questions, type questions right into there, and we have someone um, online right now who can answer those questions for you. If we think your question is, would benefit the whole entire group, we probably will save it for the end and um, ask the tour managers directly. So we are hosting this webinar to share some firsthand experiences with you of what life has been like for our students and our groups over in Europe this past spring. Throughout the spring, we had groups um, from all over, our, all over the U.S. traveling, um, and we have tried to share photos and videos of their um, experiences of their life on the road. And for the most part, they've been having the best time, right, across the board, I would say. Um, and so we've invited four tour managers um, to come over here. They're four of our most outstanding tour managers, and they are going to talk about what they experienced, what their students saw, um, if there were any safety concerns, um, and, and what their group leaders thought of the experience overall. Just so you know, um, ACIS tour managers are more than just your average tour guide. Um, while on an ACIS trip, your tour manager is with you 24 hours a day, and they are sort of the maestro of, of an ACIS trip. Um, they handle not only the educational content, but also the logistics, like what time dinner is, um, or a great place to stop for lunch. Um, even minor details, like how many gluten-free students you have on your trip. I'm sure you can all relate to that. Um, <laughs> so I have four tour managers here tonight on the line. Um, they are Dimitra Neonakis, Patrick Von Glenn, Daniel Finchrace, and Deborah Wilson. So tonight we're going to start with Deborah. Just so everybody knows a little bit about Deborah, she was a tour manager, but now she is our Spain supervisor, which means she helps out tour managers and checks in on all of our groups. Deborah uses um, what we call the SHP rating system for the happiness of our groups. For example, an SHP 10 is an extremely happy group. Um, and SHP stands for shiny happy people, right, Deborah? Shiny happy people, indeed. <laughs> All right, Deborah, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you saw this spring um, and what life on the road was like for you? Sure, yeah. Um, as you were saying, my perspective is a little bit different now because I will be checking in with all of the groups uh, that come through Spain and Portugal. Um, and so obviously uh, I was sort of fearing a possible backlash reaction to, to events. Um, and my first reaction was to go and check in with every tour manager here in Spain and Portugal and just to get the group's response. And from the tour managers, the reaction that I got uh, every time was, no, we're having way too much fun. Um, yes, everyone's aware of the situation, um, but we are totally business as usual. Um, and anything, if I took any extra measures, that it would just be sort of overkill. And they were having basically far too much fun. Um, to um, The fun that they were having was far outweighing any negative reaction. Um, they were just having to Deborah, yeah. Deborah, just to confirm, this is right after the Brussels attacks. You were checking in with exactly. everybody who was overseas, and yes, their so reaction was, that, yeah. business as yeah. usual, we're too busy having fun um, to really change anything we're doing. Exactly, yes. Um, those, that was the reaction from the tour managers. Um, then obviously, um, well, I always check in with all groups anyway, but this time, I was absolutely certain to check in in person with each and every group and um, you know, see if they wanted me to do anything special. And the reaction from the teachers was exactly the same as that of the tour managers. Business as usual, we're fine, we don't, we don't need any extra measures taken. Um, what I would say was that that was the reaction to the groups that were already here in Europe, um, calm, positive. Um, the, uh, the reaction was more from the families back in the States, which, um, yeah, that didn't surprise me. Um, um, as 
I remember it brought back a lot of memory to me of when I was traveling for the first time, when I was a teenager, um, myself traveling in a bit of a different way, backpacking. Um, and uh, if I can just um, relate a couple of incidents, when I was a teenager and I was in uh, supposedly danger-ridden uh, Guatemalan villages um, and in a war-torn Africa, and literally, people came to me, it was, oh God, I'm giving away my age here, but anyway, it was in the 1980s, and there were race disturbances going on in England, and people were literally kind of going, oh my goodness, how can you go back to England? You know, aren't you scared to be going back there? And in a very, um, uh, it was uh, on the border with um, Eritrea uh, in Africa, and people were coming up to me and saying, uh, and this was in the night as well, you know, the, the wars were going on, and um, people were saying, well, are you frightened to go home? There are riots going on in England. You know, should you be going back there? So, um, so you know, I know that the uh, it's always been a phenomenon with the media to whip up uh, a frenzy, and um, you know, but so yeah, you know, from a distance, the mm. things are always distorted. And, and of course, nowadays, you know, with the internet, it's even more so because uh, of the immediate blanket coverage. So, so anyway, I suppose I shouldn't really have been surprised that the teenagers here would experience the exact same thing that I did when I was traveling. Um, you know, the stories are based on facts, but they've always been hugely distorted and mm -hmm. they had exactly the same reaction that I did. The chances, as they have pointed out to me, that's been the most heartening thing. As they have pointed out to me, the chances of anything happening here are absolutely infinitesimal. And um, it's been helpful, I have to say, um, that the family is being able to see uh, the constant barrage of photos uh, that the students have been sending back and obviously checking in on a daily basis, they've been, um, that has totally counteracted and nullified the um, best efforts of the media to have us all in the, whipped up into a frenzy. Um, yeah, I agree. I feel like the internet has worked in two, you know, in two ways. While yes, it can whip people up into a frenzy, it also allows you to instantly send messages back of, you know, the realities of what's going on on the ground in, say, Spain or France. Um, outside of, you know, where the actual event happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, yeah, and also just to say, the, um, the teachers here, they've been, uh, the ones who have said to take me to one side, they've been really, really humbled, they said, by how mature and sensible the students have been. And the students themselves um, have been fantastic um, in their attitudes, their, like, really protective of their right to travel and very practical in their attitude. And if I can share with you actually a couple of quotes from them, which I absolutely loved, if you bear with me while I just uh, look those out. Um, yeah, there was, and I have actually corroborated these facts. They gave me these facts, I wrote them down and I have checked them and they told me there is a 1 in 25 million chance of your being involved in a major incident overseas. Whereas there's a one in six hundred and eighty five thousand chance of your drowning in a bathtub at home. Um, and yeah, but my favorite one, and uh, yeah, listen carefully on this one, my favorite one is the fact that you are much more likely <laughs> to be shot by your dog. Yes. Um, and I yeah, I did a double take too. Um, and I have verified this. They say apparently dogs have and do trigger their own as guns resulting in fatalities. So um, that was, yeah, that was I think my favorite <laughs> favorite quote. You're more likely to be shot by your dog. Um, That's and nice. oh, there was, yes, yeah. Oh and there was another story, it was it was really um, sad for the student, but um, she told me that one of the best friends whose parents hadn't allowed her to come here to Spain. And um, she was really sad. And she said that this was compounded by the fact that the week she was supposed to be traveling here with us in Spain, she was actually knocked off her bicycle in her own street in the U.S. and was in hospital. So, as as this girl said, uh, pretty ironic, huh? <laughs> so, 
So yeah, the students, I've been so impressed with how, and this, I shouldn't be surprised because it was exactly the same my experience, but they've just mm -hmm. been so um, fierce of their, in their defense of their right to travel and um, eh, am I, am I yeah. going, just a couple of other yeah, things no, to, that's... to show you, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wait, no, keep going, Deborah. Deborah, yeah, I guess okay. one of, what I want to know at this point is, you know, we. I know you met so many kids and teachers um, in Spain this spring, um, and you're planning to, you know, see even more this summer. So, but I know right now people are thinking about next year, and so for people thinking about 2017, you know, why, why? Why sign up now for a trip next year? You know, and I, I guess you sort of just touched on it, but could you elaborate a little bit on why you think people should go next year? Well, without it sounding, it's, it's, when you talk about things, it can sound like a terrible cliche, but I do think that now more than ever, we, we need to be sure that students are immersed in the different cultures and, and celebrating our differences and not giving in to the fear that uh, the news networks are, are desperate to instill in us. And to see that we are the same world over, and as I said, I think that can sound a bit cheesy, but um, I think all of us that work in this really do believe that. And, and it's, but it's a great time. I mean, you know, people here and all over Europe in you know, the, the hotels, the restaurants are really, really keen to show their very best face. So there's definitely a great new record being made. Um, of course, the dollar is really strong too, <laughs> so uh, that's a, definitely a, a winning situation. Um, no, I um, agree, Deborah. I think yeah. I think that you know there is this now more than ever um, philosophy yeah. out there right now yeah. um, that's shared by people. Um, I know people who work at ACIS. It really is part of sort of our philosophy of life, not just what we do for work, um, but you know we feel like now. It is vitally important that students get overseas and and explore the differences and the commonalities of other cultures. Um, and so I really I appreciate and and understand that from your perspective. And it you know you don't I think as a U.S. citizen we don't often think about the fact that you know someone in Spain who owns a restaurant or someone in Paris who owns a restaurant, um, you know they are relying on us to come in some ways and that. They yeah. want to share their culture with us just as much as we want to go and experience it. So um, there's two sides to that, and I really appreciate that perspective. Um, all right, thank you, Deborah. That was great. And um, now we are going to jump over to Daniel Finch Race. Daniel, hello everyone. Is a, hi, Daniel. Um, Daniel is one of our another outstanding tour manager, a four-star tour manager. Um, Daniel's a Gemini. No, I'm just kidding. I made that up. Um, <laughs> no, Daniel is um, a true scholar, and the groups he's tra he travels with adore him. One teacher wrote that there are not enough adjectives to describe how much fun they had with you, or the degree of your knowledge, um, or your professionalism. How's that for a, a review? I was like, oh. I want someone to write that well, that's very kind. I have to say, I appreciate it. You know, I will obviously be sending fifty dollars in the post, um, so that's good. <laughs> um, but uh, no, 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 I have to say, it's it's a pleasure um, taking people around. I, I just I really want to start by echoing what Deborah said. I mean, um, I was actually in um, Barcelona um, at the time of um, Brussels, um, and. Um, Deborah uh, contacted me um, and said, you know, kind of, um, obviously things have happened, you know, kind of, and, you know, kind of we're putting a contingency plan into place, um, and um, and so I talked about it with uh, my group leader, uh, someone with whom um, I've actually travelled four times now, um, and we discussed the situation. He said, no, I think the, the most important thing is to keep going. Um, you know, kind of, we've got lots of exciting things on the program um, for Barcelona, which was at the end of a tour. So we'd come down from Paris via Nice um, to Barcelona, um, and the group was really enjoying it. Um, you know, and they just wanted to go out and ride bikes along the seafront um, in Barcelona. Um, so we did, um, and you know, kind of, we were uh, wanting to be in touch and make sure you know, that everything was all right um, you know, kind of in terms of um, how the students could get in touch with their families at home. 
um, and just keeping an eye kind of on, on how they were feeling and, and kind of ensuring that everything um, was okay. But um, but yes, kind of it, it felt it still felt very buoyant, um, and um, and that sort of spirit continued. So that was um, my third tour of the season, um, and um, I actually started the year um, with a tour um, that was London, Paris, and Rome. Um, and um, obviously going to Paris, um, I, so I had a group leader um, who was concerned about traveling in February um, because she, she wanted to know um, what we were going to do with the free time and what we were going to do about public transport. Um, but that was one of the first things that we addressed when we met. Um, again, when we sort of set out a plan for how we were going to go um, through Paris, things that we were going to see. Um, and in fact, um, so we took the whole group, and so this was 45 people, so um, five chaperones and 40 students, uh, and we went up to the top of the Eiffel Tower, um, and, you could, and uh, we went up there, and we had this amazing experience of just all being together and all, um, you know, kind of just looking out over Paris, and it was it was magnificent. Um, so um, so you know, so life was continuing. We were um, in an area. Um, kind of the, it kind of really felt, you know, that people were um, going out. I mean, I remember one evening, um, it, it was the the first night of the trip, the first night that we arrived in Paris. Uh, we went out on the street and we we were going out, and people were out on, on the um, beside the brasseries and the cafes, um, and we just stopped um, and we got crepes by the side of the road. There was just a man kind of in a in a stall, and this is about nine o'clock at night. Um, making crepes, and and I, I kid you not, about 35 people must have had crepes from this stall. I mean, you know, it was like it was wondrous. Um, so you know, so we were all there, and that was just continuing. Um, so that was Paris, you know, and and Paris resurgent, if anything, as far as I could see. Um, so that I'm that sure was, you made that, 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 that crepe maker's day. <laughs> well, well, I think he made our Maybe day, which was great. Um, you yeah. know, kind of, and that's the thing. It's it's exactly what was being said before. You know, kind of, it's about people being pleased to see us. You know, kind of, mm -hmm. and we're pleased to see him. You know, because it's you know, it's that human contact. It's that moment that says, look, you know, kind of, you know, what really matters here is the space between people. You know, kind of, so kind of, we're just we're just meeting him. Kind of, and he was telling us stories about his life, and the kids were telling him stories about their lives, and saying. How much they'd enjoyed being in London, and you know what they were looking forward to in Paris, and then we were going on to Rome after that. So, you know, they they were having a great time. Um, so, you know, and so that that was a, that was a wonderful experience in in Paris. And then um, more recently, so I've just come um, from a tour uh, which was uh, London um, to Dublin uh, via Stratford upon Avon. So you know, we had the um, the great fortune of being there for um, the anniversary. Um, of uh, Shakespeare's death, the 400th anniversary, um, wow. and we just missed President Obama. Just missed him. We were going into oh. the Globe, um, you know, and we were so we were watching them performing Hamlet um, on stage while we were having our tour of the Globe, and he'd been there about 15 minutes before, um, watching the same performance. Um, you know, cause oh. so you know, so I'm, you know, there's a part of me that says if the president thinks it's safe enough, you know, to visit London and go to the Globe, you know, and see these things, then you know, surely that's good enough for all of us. Um, you know, kind of, I, uh, kind of, I, I have to say, you know, kind of, um, I, I wish I could have met him because I, I was watching kind of, you know, that what he'd been saying at the the White House correspondence dinner, and I just wanted to see him do a mic drop. I mean, it was amazing. Um, you know, kind of watching that video, and I thought oh, we, we could have seen him. We were there with him. Um, so that was great, but we so we were there in the globe, um, you know, kind of and uh, kind of seeing kind of what was going on, and that was and that was just a special treat, you know, because otherwise, you know, kind of we you know, we could have gone, we could have gone in and toured the globe and just seen it, and nobody had been there. But you know, not only were we there and seeing people actually rehearse live for Hamlet, but it was the it was for the anniversary of Shakespeare's death and indeed his birth, um, and it was the end of two years, this two year project of taking Hamlet everywhere, all over the globe. So they've been everywhere um, apart from um, two countries, um, and those two countries are Syria and North Korea. They've been everywhere else. And I just thought it was it, it, the first thing for these students to see. So they'd, they'd gone off the plane that morning at Heathrow. We'd gone straight into London, dropped the bags at the hotel, and the first thing that we did was go to the Globe and go for this tour. And they saw Hamlet. And, 
I, I think that because just for me and kind of and the stories that the kind of the kids were telling me afterwards, you know, the group leader and kind of the two um, teachers who were accompanying him, they were they were like, you know, th it's amazing, you know, just the global aspect of what that does and the, the the sort of the unifying power of seeing that drama um, you know, and making that story relatable, kind of, and the way in which you know that's gone and, and encouraged people um, to kind of to unify, to to see things in common, to um, to have you know, kind of a, a sense of um, how we are all related, um, in a kind of, and obviously for many people this is hearing something that's not even in their own language, um, and you know, and still you know, the, the power of the word goes with them, and so um, so yes, kind of, so that, that I mean that was magnificent, um, you know, just that they could be part of that, um, but you know, kind of from there we went on and we did other things, you know, so when you know, we were um, going out of London, you know, we, we stopped at the Harry Potter studios, um, you know, kind of, and it's because it, we were we were just going in there, kind of, and it was great because uh, people, were, the, the the students in the group, you know, were just going on about you know, how much they'd enjoyed seeing Shakespeare's theatre, and then talking about you know, kind of Harry Potter as an extension of that, um, you know, and and saying you know, they, that that they could say that that they'd actually looking at the text looking and thinking about Harry Potter and the films of Harry Potter uh, you know kind of as something which says okay you look, look this is about overcoming difficulties you know this is about you know kind of banding together and saying okay you know in a time of hardship you know because the lessons that we can learn from Harry Potter and I thought that was you know kind of I mean I have to say you know I, I was very impressed by that you know I thought you know could just the the critical capacity of the students by putting them in that situation I mean I just wanted to go and ride a broomstick against a green screen but you know they were they were really going for it, you know, they were really kind of saying, you know, this is why this matters, and that was that was wonderful to see. Um, and then, um, you know, kind of as far kind of as the situation, because I've, I've sort of been all over this season um, so far, um, you know, kind of going to you know, kind of just um, a wonderful variety of places, you know, so um, Barcelona, Berlin, Dublin, Edinburgh, London, Rome, um, you know, just to name kind of, you know, kind of the big cities, um, and you could have, and obviously kind of a lot of smaller places um, along the way. Uh, things that we've added in, um, you know, kind of where you know we were in the south of France, we were able to add things, you know, like going to places that um, kind of um, you you would want to kind of go and see, kind of if you could just squeeze them in. So going to Avignon to see the Papal Palace, going to Aix-en-Provence to see, you know, kind of where Cézanne was and worked. Um, you know, kind of going down into the Camargue, I and mean, you could see the horses of the Camargue, and you know, just you know, all those wonderful things. And and every place that I visited, life was continuing. Because okay, mm -hmm. um, the only place um, kind of in which I noticed a slight increase, um, kind of in scanning and bag checks, as you might expect, was in Paris, um, and that was just at, at major sites. So the Arc de Triomphe and Les Invalides, um, you know, and that's you know, kind of something that. Kind of it can happen kind of at any time. You know that's is something so that can. Daniel, they, you're that, saying that throughout your travel. Sorry to interrupt you. But throughout your no, travels, you know, for the most part, things were, you know, business as usual. But you know, you noticed heightened security at, at a few places where they were doing yes. extra bag checks. Things like okay, so at like Invalide and um, the Arc de Triomphe were just increased bag checks. Yes, um, but the, not the, the the sort of thing. Not, nobody kind of was was worried. There wasn't an atmosphere of you know, of, of any sort of disquiet. This was just you know because they they were wanting to be watchful. You know, kind of, and I think you know because yeah. that made us all feel more secure for that. You know, because they yeah. they're just monitoring and and for our experience of the sites, it didn't hinder us kind of from experiencing the sites fully. I mean, you could know, it, it took you know kind of perhaps an extra. 30 seconds to a minute to go in, you know, kind of buy, you know, because they want to check the bags, you know, kind of obviously, you know, kind of unzip your coats and so on, and that's it, you know, kind of, and so, yeah. so in terms of kind of the, the monitoring, that, that, I mean, made me feel safer. I mean, the, the group leader with whom I was on that trip said, you know, kind of that, that he felt safer, um, you know, kind of because he could see that the security was there, um, you know, kind of, so, so I that agree. was good. And I, I, think, I think for the most part, people, are sort of up for it. Like we, we're happy to have the additional security, um, even if it means you know the extra thirty seconds. I know for Boston this spring we had the marathon um, just a couple weeks ago, and there was a lot of heightened security, a lot of additional bag checks, um, a few different you know policy changes for along the route even. 
um, and and everybody was just on board. You know, it's just um, it's just sort of become the new way of life for us. And and I think that you know whether it's happening here or overseas, um, that everybody seems to really just be carrying on, which is great. Great. So yes. Daniel, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to hear your perspectives, and I. Um, I so am with you on what you were saying about the crepe maker and, you know, the moments that happen in between sort of scheduled events. So for me, when I look at a catalog page, you know, of an itinerary or a trip, I always think, um, you know, it's not just a visit to the globe. You know, it's, you know, it says that on the piece of paper, but you, you never know what it's going to be. It could be, you know, seconds from meeting the President of the United States or, you know, the seeing the rehearsal of Hamlet. So. Um, thanks for that perspective, and I do think it is the moments that make these trips, um, for sure, for me and for the kids, and obviously for you too. Absolutely, yes. Right. Yeah. All right. So we are going to hear from Patrick now. Patrick is another four-star tour manager, which um, I'm going to keep saying that because all of you um, got four stars and all of your reviews from this spring. Um, but Patrick, there was a lot of love in your reviews. Teachers loved you. The students loved you, um, and I just thought, wow, there's a lot of love being thrown around here. Um, and one I loved, it said, it said even the even the adults loved you, and I thought, ooh. <laughs> um, no, there were a lot of very funny, very personable, professional, outstanding. Um, you got some pretty incredible reviews. So we'd love to hear from you on your perspective of this lovely spring you had. Lovely spring. This was an absolutely fantastic spring for me. So, as a little background on me, I'm I'm actually a, secretly a scientist, and I've uh, I've been just just taken to travelling. Uh, um, last year, I got um, got brought into the ACIS fold by um, a long-term ACIS uh, manager, Tom Upton, uh, who, who who brought me in. I hadn't even thought of doing tours. I uh, just uh, you know was looking for a for a summer job. And got involved and just absolutely loved it, and have just been addicted to it ever since. And uh, this um, this this summer has been absolutely packed. This spring and summer, and it's been a treat for me because it's all been technology themed tours, technology and uh, and science themed tours, uh, which is absolutely my speciality. And I've just come back from uh, a tour of Switzerland and Germany, where we. Um, went to CERN, the um, particle accelerator in, uh, oh, yes. in Switzerland. Yeah, CERN, so a big international collaboration between not just all of the European countries, but also the United States, Israel, South Africa, Australia. It's a huge international collaboration. Um, and my tours took me to the United Nations. I've been there three times now this spring, and I absolutely don't get bored of it any time because they also have, always have incredibly interesting guides who work at the UN. And the thing which keeps it really interesting is that all the students have different perspectives, different um, uh, knowledge that they bring to the tours and different questions. Um, so every tour of the UN is totally different. Um, and just seeing what the, the kids are getting out of, uh, of these tours, understanding you know, the difficulties of getting 193 different nations together around a table, uh, trying to understand each other, trying to make decisions. It's just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. sounds amazing. And you know the, you know the STEM. I don't know if you guys have that term overseas, but there's a huge emerging um, push for STEM activities in schools um, across the U.S. right now. And STEM is science, technology engineering and math, um, and there's just a huge movement to, to get students more involved, um, you know, beyond the science fair and the regular classes they take, but really pushing students toward, you know, majoring in these things in school and having a, a real focus on them. Yeah, there's absolutely the same, uh, same sort of push in the UK, so I'm, oh, okay. I'm, I'm used to these, uh, the, the push that schools are giving to this. And um, yeah, I found I found that a lot on um, on my tours that a lot of the students were particularly passionate about uh, science, uh, technology, and mathematics. Um, on the tour that I, I just went on, we also the teachers. It was a custom tour, 
Um, so the teachers had organized various extra activities, one of which was to visit a nuclear reactor. And now if you're talking about slightly heightened security in Paris, that was absolutely nothing to what we saw at the um, nuclear reactor. It took an hour to get all 30 um, people on the tour through the um, security clearance, all passports checked, all, um, all bags handed in. We had to go through a, um, we all had to wear dosometers to um, check the radiation that we were being exposed to when we went in and when we came out, we had to uh, be scanned for um, you know, exposure, radiation exposure, we had to wear funny hats, we had to wear shoe covers, but inside it was, <laughs> and, and we had to go through um, like doors that felt like vacuum doors to go into a spaceship, um, one wow. at a time. We had uh, there were police checking out, checking us in. So yeah, they had a little tiny extra, a couple of bag bag checks uh, going into the Louvre was was nothing compared to this. Mm. So I'm sure the students love that. Just putting on the special outfits alone must have just set them into a complete tizzy. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> going, going back so you to didn't the, really see other than bag checks and things like that. Things were were business as usual for you too. Very much business as as usual, and um, not just yeah, not just on on tour. Something I um, I'd want to uh, make clear is that you know I I live in a capital city, uh, Berlin, European capital city. I spend a lot of time uh, in other capital cities um, around Europe, not just with tours. So Paris, um, Brussels, London, um, and life is just going on completely as normally for everybody, even. Mm -hmm. um, I, one of one of my close friends is working at the European Commission in Brussels, and of course the the week the week of the Brussels attack, uh, um, there was lockdown. The city was on on total lockdown, and uh, no one was no people weren't carry on as normal. But it was remarkable how quickly um, life just returns because you know things uh, jobs need to get done. People uh, need to get to work. They they started using the metro system again. They started uh, going on public transport, um, and now everyone's just continuing with their life. And that's yeah. that's right in Brussels, where it happened. Everywhere else, there wasn't even even that. Even in the immediate um, uh, aftermath, there was. You really wouldn't uh, you notice absolutely no difference in in day to day life. I feel safe. And the teachers, the teachers you were with, and the students you were with, they, you know, did they talk to you about this? Did they express concern, or was it just? So I was, I was also on tour um, during the Brussels attack, and that was in, uh, we were in uh, Lausanne at the time, uh, so beautiful uh, town on, on Lake Geneva. We had just visited the uh, Olympic Museum, so we were very much in the. Uh, in the spirit of international collaboration on the day, and um, we just the teacher and I um, called the group together, and we explained what had happened um, in the morning that that there had been another attack, um, and the teacher was fantastic. She was uh, extremely calm. Um, she calmed. She didn't need to calm the students down. They weren't uh, uncalm. Um, but she she kept a um, fantastic presence of um, calm with the group, and she the main uh, again we've heard this from other people the main um, the main people were, who were concerned were actually the people back in the United States at at home. It was the teachers um, who who were extremely uh, concerned about about the group about their kids, and the teacher did a great job of very quickly with the help of ACIS uh, from the excellent communication system that systems that we have in place. Um, within hours, all the, t uh, all the parents had been reassured that the group was very happy, still having fun um, all together. And uh, I had been contacted by um, an equivalent of Deborah for Spain. It was uh, Giacomo was uh, checking up on me, someone from the London office, um, and immediately saying, you know, how is your um, group feeling? Um, are there any concerns? Um, and you know, reassure, just reassuring us that uh, 
um, ACIS has uh, contingency plans that would be put in into action and immediately no expenses spared if there, if there was any um, uh, any any particular threat in the city that we were going to the um, you know there's absolutely no way that ACIS would ever put the um, the group in any sort of danger um, yeah. so everyone was just very reassured by that um, yeah I, I think we, you know from to just speak from the state side of that um, you know an issue, when anything occurs in the world, our first reaction is, you know, we immediately, where are, where are our students, where are our people, you know, we are in constant communication, and then it's feeding that information, you know, that everyone is safe and where they are and communicating that back to the parents as quickly as possible. And we do have a pretty amazing emergency response system in place right now that um, just, as someone who works for ACIS, you know, I know that if my phone rings and it's a parent or a teacher or a school administrator, um, that I can confidently tell them, you know, what's going on, and and that our communication, um, you know, after any of of the events that have happened in the past years, um, has just been outstanding. And and I, it's nice to hear the other side of that. That from your perspective, you felt that same level of confidence and and understanding that you know we truly are a team, whether um, we're here talking to parents directly or whether you're trying to communicate that information back to them. I really appreciate that. Um, Patrick, thank you so much for sharing your stories. It was really interesting to hear um, about all of your scientific visits and I'm sure those students yeah. will never forget that. Um, it sounds amazing. Just, as, a final, as, a, as a final note, uh, we were, uh, you're asking Deborah why uh, 2017 um, is a particularly uh, great time to be uh, going going on a tour, uh, and she she said that you know uh, at a time like this, um, uh, it's extremely important to remind people that you know we're global citizens that we're um, we are all connected, and you need to be reaching out and understanding other related cultures. And I I, I really um, uh, found my my student connecting with that hugely, uh, especially with. With, with two visits, one the visit of the UN really understanding um, that all these nations are together trying to trying to work together for peace and the prosperity of, of humanity and reminding us that you know we all have these basic rights that people are working hard to um, uh, to protect and we then went across the road to the uh, Red Cross um, Museum. Uh, the Red Cross was uh, founded in in, in Geneva and its headquarters are still there and uh, the museum proved to be an ex like a very emotional experience um, because it's told through the uh, through the stories of uh, real um, victims of humanitarian disasters and the students really saw that it's um, it's the millions and it's, it's actually there's millions of volunteers working for the Red Cross um, and these students you know they, they saw through this, this um, museum uh, and through these stories, that uh, they really are connected to everybody in the world, and there is a difference that they can make. And they suggested setting up their own uh, Red Cross society when they get back to the states. So this wow, really see how these these trips are broadening these students' minds, and they're inspiring them to um, go ahead and make a difference to this world. Yeah. Well, thank you. I that's that was just really my, cool. Um, yeah, I think um, I didn't know there was a Red Cross Society Museum in Geneva, so I just wrote that down for myself. Um, thank you for sharing that story. I think it's, that it's, you know it's a, it's a phenomenal museum. It's actually the most. Uh, it's the it's the only time I've cried in a museum. Actually, I have to say. Yeah, and I know what other students students said the same. All right, thank you so much for that, Patrick. That's really powerful. I appreciate that. Um, all right, we are going to move on to um, Demetra to hear from her. She has been traveling throughout Greece and Italy this spring. Um, Demetra is our also a four-star tour manager. I just have to say that again. And someone asked, what does that mean? It's four out of four. So you could get four, and you all got four. So I'm just you know laying that out there so everybody understands that it's not just some made-up number. Um, Demetra is our 
Instagram queen, or at least that's what I call you, Demetra, because I follow you on Instagram, and some days you post more pictures of you and your students having fun than I post on Instagram in a year. So I know you're having fun every day, and I know that you're doing really fun and exciting things with your students. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit about your spring. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I do. I do have so much fun. And most of the times I, I finish up a group and say, you know what? I felt like I was on vacation with you guys. Thank you so much for the vacation. <laughs> uh, but I, to begin with, I'd like to echo kind of what everybody else has said regarding um, life going on. I mean, I, I grew up in the States. I was born in Greece, grew up in the States, and I've been back in Greece for the past 20 odd years. Um, I live in Athens, so I live in a big city. I live in a city that's been, you know, much maligned, I think, uh, <laughs> recently um, in, in the media. So that goes back to all of the, what Deborah mentioned earlier about the media sort of distorting things. I mean, you know, the streets aren't on fire here. <laughs> we, we do, you know, go to ATMs and get money out. We can go to the, the supermarket. Everything's fine. So I think that most people though, have the, the critical capacity to understand that, you know, where the media takes things kind of in the wrong direction. And it was so evident to me uh, this spring when I was on tour with, uh, with groups. In fact, I also was, was with a group um, in Sorrento, actually, when the, uh, when the Brussels attack, uh, attacks happened. And I was just humbled, really, by, by the, the ability of the, all of the, the teachers, there were four groups, actually, because there was Christian to one, so we were 40-some-odd people. But all of the teachers sort of unanimously said, well, this is the world we live in, and this is a fact of life, and there's always going to be something. Um, there will always be something that, you know, will make people uh, who need an excuse, let's say, to, to not travel, to not travel. And it's, it's, it's not something that should deter us from traveling. I mean, uh, one of the teachers reminded me of the 80s and the, you know, the, the PLO and uh, the IRA in England and the, I don't know the, the Basque terrorists and so many different things that at different periods of history, you know, or, or recent history really, have have kind of put the fear put fear into people's uh, heads. But you know, you can't let that stop you. And 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 I think most people are able to see that and and able to move past that and beyond that. Um, sure, there, there's heightened security in different places, and I saw that um, mostly in Italy, actually. I saw a lot more uh, security in, for example, places that I'd never seen it before, like uh, the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi. Just last week I was there with a group on uh, one of the, the great uh, sellers, let's say, of ACS, the Bellitalia uh, trip. And um, so we couldn't even enter the basilica, you know, before being scanned by, you know, so a couple of policemen who were outside. But really, again, it was just a matter of, as I think um, Daniel said, 30 seconds to, to a minute, you know, of, of, of being delayed. So it was something that made everybody, has always made everybody feel, on all these trips that I've taken uh, since February, so post Paris and then, you know, post Brussels, it's made everybody feel unanimously safer and you know they just think well this is this is the way of the world and this is these are the things that we have to do in order to to continue living our lives and not letting um, you know the small very very small minority kind of dictate what we are going to do with ourselves um, so yeah everybody has been and just I think the 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 reassurance that they receive not just from from ACIS but from each other, you know, that, okay, yeah, these things do happen, unfortunately, but there's such a small, Deborah mentioned that the chances of, you know, uh, slipping and falling in your bathtub versus being, you know, in a, in a terrorist attack. Yes, these are, these are, you know, documented statistics, so of course you have to sort of take things in stride and, and put things into perspective, you know, there, there are many, many more reasons to travel than not to, you know, and, um, and no matter what, I mean, just a personal kind of um, example is that I have twin eight-year-old daughters, and um, we went to Paris for Christmas. You know, my family, my husband, my, my daughters, and I went to Paris for a week uh, at Christmas, and we had a fantastic time, and we used the, you know, public transportation to no end, and felt like, yeah, probably this is one of the safest cities in the world right now. 
Um, and it's a place we want to go to. It's a place we want our daughters to see, and we're going to do it. We're not going to let this stop. So I see that in more and more people uh, as well, and, and I'm hoping that that you know, is, is the, the sort of the mindset that, uh, that prevails. Um, yeah, I agree. But, I hope so, too. I do. Yeah. So you mentioned the the fun, <laughs> the trips, and I really, I mean, I think that something that um, that you had mentioned in the, when speaking with Patrick was that these moments that uh, you know that aren't on the itinerary. Of course, seeing you know the thrill of seeing the Parthenon or the Colosseum for the first time is something you know for most people is a life changing experience. But I think all these little moments that happen on every tour without fail are the ones are are the are the glue sort of that hold these trips together and are, are what make the trips, I think, unique and, 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 and I don't know, um, uh, like the, the unplanned things, the impromptu things that we do that, um, uh, I don't know, just for example, I had a group uh, in February, it was an Amadeus uh, trip, so starting in Venice and heading up through Austria and to, into Prague. And we were in different spots the, in, in Salzburg, for example, you know, singing the Sound of Music songs at the spot where it was sung in the, mu in, the, in the movie, while one of the kids had YouTube playing and showing everybody, yeah, look, 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 stand there, this is where it was, you know, things like that. Or um, in Olympia, just in, uh, in the beginning of April, I had a group uh, in Greece, and, uh, you know, running, running a race in the original Olympic Stadium. These things aren't on the itineraries, but they are the, the things that kids will remember. Of course they're going to remember the, the, you know, the historical and the academic side of things, but it's the little things that, that really make things fun. I mean, I don't know, I love taking my groups on any kind of uh, adventure, and especially if it involves cycling or, I don't know, segueing or whatever. And these are always the things that, you know, at the end of the day, kids would just say, this was, these are these experiences that are off the beaten path, they're not the, the, the tourist standards that everybody does, and it's what makes everybody's, uh, each and everybody's experience different and more, and more meaningful at the end. Yeah, I agree. I think oftentimes they're the things you can't, you can't pre-book or plan, they're, you know, sing-alongs on the bus, or mm. just the little things that those mm. are going to be the things that they remember. No, and they do, they, without fail, they happen on every trip. And it's not yeah. just one, it's many times. It's, I, I would say pretty much every day. I mean, there are, of course, all of the planned fun stuff, you know, activities that, that we have, like the gelato making that I absolutely adore, or the, I don't know, the, um, the Mozart chocolate ball making. That was so much fun in Austria. These things are on the itinerary, but unless you do them, you don't really, just by reading a line, you don't get the full sort of impact of it. So this is where, where the Instagram account comes into play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I like to document everything extensively. <laughs> so yes. In any case, yeah, so these are, these are for me, this is what, what holds everything together. It's these, these moments, you know, interspersed, sort of peppered throughout the, the trips that, um, you know, that just make an ACIS trip sort of stand head and shoulders above the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I agree, Demetra. Thank you so much for for sharing that, and and Absolutely. I want to thank you all because, you know, just talking about your trips this spring and you know these moments that happen overseas and you know your experiences with teachers overseas. You know, oftentimes we're here, we're talking to the teachers, we're talking to parents, we're talking to students um, about what's going to happen overseas, and and so it's. It's always just delightful to hear that all the things we promise them are going to happen, um, and you know us sitting here telling them, you're, you know, there is a little bit of heightened security, but every life is, you know, is carrying on as normal, is just doesn't hold as much value as hearing it from you, um, you know, firsthand from, you know, being on the road with the teachers. So I know that everyone listening appreciates that too, um, and just. You know, just confirming everything that we know to be true, that, you know, what we do is important, um, and offering these students this opportunity is important. Um, and I think it was Patrick saying that, you know, we're all connected um, and that we all sort of have a role to play in this, you know, future, the future of our, our, our world. Um, and that, you know, when we get out and we meet new people and we have experiences with the crepe maker um, or... Um, you know the the museum in in Geneva that 
those are the things that shape us as people and really change our worldview. So I appreciate so much hearing from all of you. I think it's really valuable um, for me personally and, and for everyone else. So I want to take some questions right now because we have had a few people um, writing questions in. Um, so one of the questions was about free time, which I think we've touched on a little bit. But someone asked if the tour managers are with the group all the time. Um, Daniel, can I pass this one to you? Could you just explain how free time works? Yes, yeah, certainly. So um, free time um, is a, a concept where, whereby there is something um, in the itinerary, there's a space in the itinerary that says we're in a place, um, but we're not, we've not got a booked activity. So uh, what we do then is going to be to liaise with the teacher um, and say, okay, what could we do with this time? You know, what does the group want to do? How are we going to get the most out of these, you know, these hours that we have? You know, kind of, you know, whether it's you know, kind of an hour here or three hours there. What are we going to do? Um, and um, so that it's always a discussion with the group leader. And I mean, and I've um, ended up doing some great things kind of with free time because sometimes it will be free time on an afternoon. Sometimes it will be free time in an evening. Um, and uh, there are all sorts of things uh, that I ended up doing uh, this season, kind of, which were wonderful um, at various times. So uh, one thing, that, so the first tour that I did um, of the year, so uh, starting in London, um, uh, we had a free evening um, after dinner, um, and um, the group was really interested in uh, tales, in ghost stories, um, kind of, and um, and the, the tales of London's dark side from the 19th century. Um, so um, the, the teacher um, suggested, could, could we go on some sort of like walking tour? Could we go around and do something quite atmospheric? Um, so uh, we we ended up going for. Uh, a tour kind of around uh, the east end of London uh, with um, a kind of a, a guide um, who was telling us all sorts of ghoulish stories, uh, and then you know kind of would uh, sort of go and uh, hide in doorways, and then jump out at people um, and so on. So it it was all very atmospheric um, kind of and, and well done. Um, and um, so, we can, so we would do that sort of thing on an evening. And then um, the, the most recent tour that I was on, uh, we were in Oxford. Um, and so we had a book visit. We went in to see um, uh, Oxford Cathedral. So we were, we were inside Christ Church College, um, which was you know, a real privilege because, of course, it's you know, exam time for the students in Oxford at the moment. So um, that we were still allowed to go in. Kind of, uh, we were as quiet as dormouse. Um, and you know, we still, you know, kind of uh, got a chance to go around and see the cathedral. And then we had some time after that before driving up to um, Stratford. So we went punting. Um, so kind of, so we went out. You kind of, uh, some people uh, went on um, pedal boats. Um, kind of, so we had a couple of pedal boats go out, and this is everybody. So you know, kind of, um, the teacher, the two chaperones, you know, kind of, and all the students, and and me too. You know, for what it was worth, because you know, kind of, I can't punt for toffee. I can't, you know, kind of uh, make a boat go in a straight line for toffee with a with a pole like a gondolier in Venice. I, uh, I think I, I would not get my license. Um, but that was that was excellent. Um, and then, um, and you know, so so we had that, um, and in the tour just before that, it worked probably and you know, one of the the highlights, one of the guilty pleasures um, and you know, the, that we managed to fit in with free time was we had a, a free afternoon um, in London towards the end of the trip, um, and I had a um, so I had three groups with me, um, kind of in so kind of three different uh, teachers, um, and it transpired that they were all um, absolutely in love with Wicked. Um, so uh, we we said right okay well let's make this happen let's go and see Wicked in London you know, go go and see it you know, kind of in, um, you know, have the real Wicked experience so because um, so we arranged um, to go um, and see Wicked and you know, went along with everybody and um, and indeed we had a Wicked good time um, so you know <laughs> so it was it, you know kind of it, it was marvelous you know we're all singing along and then it, and then uh, we went to the London Eye after that so it, we went for dinner and then we went to London Eye in the evening we hadn't again something that we hadn't booked but we just got organized you know the, the teachers wanted mm -hmm. to do it the kids wanted to do it so we made it happen um, and on the way to the London Eye the kids started singing to people um, as we were walking along the side of the Thames um, you know, kind of just you know, kind of, and, and people were singing back because there were these performers, you know, kind of by the side of the Thames. So you know, they were riffing off each other as we were walking along to the London Eye, and wonderful, absolutely wonderful. That sounds so fun. So I think to encapsulate what you just said, free time there can be structured activities that are added in. Um, 
you know, some things like theater or, you know, paddle boats. Um, but oftentimes students can also, someone just asked about, you know, what if a student doesn't want to go off on his own? Now, we never suggest that students go off alone. They're always in groups of at least three, we say. Um, so sometimes there is just time to be in a small group of three in maybe uh, an area of Paris, you know, like right after city sightseeing, you may break off into small groups of three to explore the Latin Quarter and grab lunch. So free time can work in lots of different ways. Um, and just to answer that person's question, um, no, you will never have to go off on your own. Um, you would always be in a group of at least three students. Um, and you know, if there was someone who didn't want to do that, they could stay with the, the teacher or the tour manager as well. So that's always an option. All right, so I'm going to move on to another question, and this one's for Deborah. Um, someone asked if there are people like you, Deborah, who check in on all groups in other parts of Europe. I know um, the answer indeed. to this one, Deborah. I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> yes. Indeed, there are. As um, I think it was Patrick said that. Uh, the equivalent of me uh, <laughs> was Giacomo. I could never be the equivalent of Giacomo. Those of you who've met him know what a charming young man he is. Um, but yes, indeed, and not just um, a, a team of supervisors, as as well. You know, we also have people coming over from the states, and the big surprise for a lot of people this year was seeing Peter Jones himself, who checked in on. What looks like hundreds of groups uh, in Paris and in Italy. So, so yes, we do very much like to um, just be have an added face, a name. Um, somebody else, so people feel that uh, we're always, uh, always around, and, and certainly obviously not just um, in these situations. Uh, we always do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just to follow up on that. Um, Peter Jones, just in case anyone doesn't know, he's the president of our company. Um, he is pretty much guaranteed to be out and about in the spring and the summer visiting and checking in on groups. Um, in, in addition to stateside staff that we send over, plus our overseas staff like Deborah and Giacomo. Um, and then if there were a situation where we couldn't get a staff member to check in on you physically, there usually is a phone call by um, one of your program consultants stateside or someone in our um, our London or our Paris office might might give a phone call to the tour manager um, or pop in on you um, whenever. But whenever and wherever we can, we are all about quality control. We want to make sure people are having fun um, and really that we are delivering the product and the experiences that we um, promise. That is what we are all about, probably more so than any other c travel company out there. Um, that is what we pride ourselves on. And it's also a lot of fun, um, which I know is sort of the underlying theme of our, our chat here. All right, I have um, a couple more questions that I want to um, ask. So, um, Patrick, I'm going to ask this one to you, and you sort of touched on this, um, but someone asked what we would say to their principal or school board who are reluctant to approve a trip for next year. You know, what would you say to a school board looking to approve a trip? So, my... I think my main, yeah, my main point would be that um, there shouldn't shouldn't be really much difference between approving a trip now and approving a trip, um, say in in 2014, um, because the uh, the risks we're looking at really haven't changed at all. So, um, I, I I can absolutely confidently say that um, I I'm living my life exactly as. As I as I always have and everyone and is and we're not doing it blindly we're doing it because we really don't feel there is uh, an increased risk this year. This is um, um, you know you, we we have great reasons to be going on these trips. These trips are incredible fun. They're an extremely great educational experience. That's that's something that's that's why uh, you know why to go with ACIS in particular. Um, what what we do is we really uh, we really deliver the educational content. Um, you know, with for for example these uh, these these tours that we do to uh, things like you know looking right inside the United Nations building. We were doing doing that while um, talks were going on. You know, we we say oh we can't go in this room at the moment because there's um, there's there's uh, peace you know peace talks. Uh, uh, about Syria going on in that room right there. We can't can't go in there. So 
2017. Um, it's important to to go go this year because you know, we're, like I said, we're all connected um, um, connected as a as a global world more than ever. Um, yeah. So I started rambling yeah. a bit at the end, but yeah. that's all right. No, that's great. I, you know what? I think it's it, it's really hard to nail down, you know, one reason. I mean, because we're all coming from the perspective that you know this is we've sort of made this our lives, right? Is is taking these students through these experiences, sharing educational information with them, sharing these authentic one-off moments that happen, um, and and it is it's hard to encapsulate in sort of a document, let's say, for a school board or a principal, um, the value of these experiences. And I think we can't really put it in, we can't really put it in terms that are simple because it, they're not simple. You know, these experiences are so valuable and, and they change the lives of these students um, and they lead to um, them having completely different lives. I mean, I, I know that. I lived that myself um, from traveling as a student. It led me to my career in travel and wanting to do it, you know, for and to give that experience to other students. So, you know, I, I have to say, though, we're thrilled because people are traveling and, and our groups are going and people are signing up for next year. Um, and, and, of course, we want more people and as many people as possible to go. Um, because that's what we do, and that's what we believe, and and the alternative, you know, staying home and adding bricks to our bunker, just isn't an option. So, I really want to thank all of you so much, and thank all of our listeners um, for their great questions and for their participation. And I hope you guys keep doing what you're doing. Um, just talking to you tonight made me want to, I don't know, spend an hour on your bus listening and learning all about um, your stories. And I'm sure you have a million more stories you could tell tonight. Um, so I would ask everyone who um, is listening to this webinar to stay connected to ACIS. And if you are interested in hearing what's going on overseas, follow our blog. Um, we do have an Instagram account as well. We also have a Facebook page that you can like. Um, and all, those, all of our social media channels, Twitter, um, you can follow what's going on overseas and learn more about ACIS um, and stay connected to what is going on with us um, and how we are staying up on everything that's happening and changing in the world. So thank you so much, everyone, and um, yeah, I really appreciate you listening. Thanks.